So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to ShmooCon again. This is uh, the uh, Bring It On track, um, Saturday morning, nice, bright, and early, 11 a.m. Uh, we have a great uh, panel here coming up uh, with a bunch of experts on the U.S. government and various aspects of the U.S. government. Uh, so we're, we're t calling it Ask the Feds. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves. So let's give them a round of applause. Start them off. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning. So uh, every year there is Ask the EFF, and we felt that it was time for some equal time. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on in your government, in the policy space, but also give you guys a chance to engage. So we're going to briefly introduce ourselves, talk a little about what we do across the federal government in different parts, uh, but then also we want to take your questions. About half of this session will be devoted to Q&A. Uh, so I will kick off. Uh, I'm Alan Friedman. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is a part of the Department of Commerce that focuses on maintaining a free, open, and trustworthy internet. And my job is to figure out what the government can do to promote better markets for security. You know, everyone says, gosh, the market for security is broken. I was hired to help fix that. Uh, as long as I don't spend taxpayer money or regulate companies in a way that would, you know, require job-killing regulation uh, or, you know, complicated rulemaking procedures. Uh, so uh, my background is I was a computer scientist and I wasn't a very good one, so I got my PhD in applied economics, which means I'm not a very good economist, uh, and I'm not a very good computational modeler. And when you're mediocre at that many things, you end up in Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, but it's been a real pleasure to be in the government uh, and, and be able to work with so many talented, dedicated people, and they really are. And I think especially those who are in the area know that there are a lot of people who work very hard in the government. And, uh, one of the things our takeaway today is going to be you guys should get involved. Uh, we desperately need engagement. Uh, you know, Bruce brought up yesterday in his rant that you know, the really important things, the really important discussions are going on on the other side of town. Uh, and you guys can get engaged and we hope that we will give you some of the tools to do that today. All right, well that's quite a... Uh a spiel to follow. So I'm Jessica Wilkerson. I am a professional staff member with the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, we have jurisdiction over almost everything you can imagine. Uh, we have jurisdiction over commerce, health, energy, telecommunications. That all falls into our portfolio. And I handle all of our, all of our cybersecurity policy work. Um, so I have a minors in both computer science and uh, mathematics, which is kind of how I ended up in tech policy. It was mostly an accident, but it ended up being a fortuitous accident, and uh, I will look forward to answering all of your questions when we get to that, uh, that part of the talk. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Mill. Uh, so I'm with the most exciting federal agency in the federal government, the General Services Administration. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need any services at all, just talk to me after the, after the panel. Uh, my background is as a software engineer and web developer. Uh, so I graduated in, in 05 and just working out uh, with different consulting firms for a little while. Um, got uh, generally kind of activated in politics around like 08, 09. Uh, joined a, a nonprofit called the Sunlight Foundation uh, here in DC. Uh, I was there for about five years doing um, building APIs and apps, but also learning a ton and participating in open government and transparency policy initiatives, got to work with Congress and, and, uh, and with the White House. Uh, now I joined GSA a couple of years ago, uh, in, well, almost three years ago now, May of 2014. I'm on a, t a relatively, joined a relatively new office there called 18F, like 18F, uh, which uh, is, is named after 18th and F Street. It's, a, it's a, an excruciatingly hip name. Uh, and w our, our job there at 18F is to uh, kind of try to de-lobotomize the government on technology uh, a little bit, and uh, we want to make sure we can we can build things in house. We can use modern approaches to things, and I can talk a little bit more about that after. Uh, and my name is Nick Lizerson. I work as the legislative director on the personal staff of Congressman Jim Langevin, a Democrat from Rhode Island. Uh, I will caveat everything I'm going to say with the fact that. Uh, the views that I'm expressing here are my own and aren't that of my congressman. 
Uh, he's a great guy. He loves, uh, he loves engagement with the security research community. He's glad I'm here, but what I'm talking about are my views, not necessarily his. Um, so that, that, that I think applies to all of us today. I, like, I would oh, guess yeah. so. <laughs> bad bureaucrats, we forgot to mention that. Um, so I came here actually last year to SHMU to talk about trying to increase congressional engagement. I'm glad to be back. Uh, my job as legislative director mostly entails advising the congressman on domestic security issues. He's on the Committee on Homeland Security and the Armed Services Com uh, Committee. He's also the co-chair and co-founder of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus. And uh, I have a degree in computer science. I happened to go to school in Rhode Island and lucked out in getting a job with him and then discovered that my policy interests and his align very closely. Um, and so I am here mostly, uh, again, to try and convince you all to please help government, Congress in particular, but I think government more broadly, uh, to understand the, the very serious issues that we're facing and not do stupid stuff. So one of the first challenges uh, when one is trying to engage is to realize that the federal government is amazingly vast. Uh, again, those of you who support the federal government in some capacity probably know that if for no other reason that getting paid by them is a bit of a pain. Uh, but the broad challenge is to sort of simply know where to engage. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to have uh, folks from Congress and from the administration here uh, as the two main branches. But even inside the administration, you have commissions, which are independent, the Federal Trade Commission, which is an independent commission, and then you have organizations like mine, uh, which is part of the administration that report directly to uh, the president. So some of the initiatives that we're working on right now uh, are really built around community engagement. Uh, so under the assumption that we don't have time to sit around and go through the regulatory process, and sometimes even amazing people on the Hill uh, may not be nimble enough to target very particular questions where we can really move the ball forward. And so we wanted to sort of find areas of security where rather than waiting for a law to pass or figure out how to regulate, uh, let's just try to bring people in a room and say, you know, if we can solve this ourselves, it'll save everyone a lot of trouble down the road. Uh, and that has involved, you know, really taking on some, some important issues we feel. So vulnerability disclosure, uh, raise your hand if you've ever disclosed a vulnerability to a uh, vendor. Uh, raise your hand if that was a great process. There are not nearly as many hands up. We're trying to change that. This is not a new question, right? We've been fighting this battle for a long time. Uh, and our goal was to say, this is no longer a question of the software world. This is now something that involves medical devices. This involves your bank account. This involves your car. How do we create a culture where vendors want to work with you and that security researchers know how to easily access it? Now, again, there have been people who have been blazing the trail. Katie Mazur is right here in the front row. has uh, been really doing amazing work. Uh, what we wanted to do was take that and say, this is now the expectation, this is the norm. And we got hackers, uh, we got traditional software companies, we got car manufacturers, we had think tanks come to the table and say, all right, let's figure out what the expectations are, let's learn what researchers are, are concerned about, and let's build out some basics so that people know where to start. We're also doing some work on everyone's favorite term, IoT. Uh, it's, a, it's like the cyber, right? You can complain about what a horrible term it is, but everyone's using it, so we're going to have to use it as well. Uh, IoT security, huge issue, as everyone knows. Uh, but when we say, what should we do about it, people say, well, what if we just built devices securely? Gosh, why didn't I think of that? Uh, it's a little harder than that. But one thing that we can start to say, let's talk about security updatability. Let's add, say, you know, how are the devices in our homes patchable? Well, we know what patching means in the software space. There isn't a clear consensus on what it means in the consumer space, in the device space. So it doesn't matter what that definition is as long as consumers and manufacturers have the shared vision. And so we brought together manufacturers, security experts, consumer advocates to have that discussion. Uh, that's the type of work we do. If you're interested in engaging or have a good idea of a discussion that we should be having, please come and talk to us. Well, great, and um, 
Alan has, of course, given me a very good lead in because my committee has also been very involved in coordinated disclosure as well. So we have actually been working. Thank you. Uh, we have actually been working directly with the automobile and medical device industries, having conversations with them about how they can incorporate security researchers into their cybersecurity processes. So you have quite a few companies who are still a little bit skittish. They think um, they still have that, you know, person in a basement kind of mentality, who are these people uh, kind of attitude, and we're trying to change that, and especially with some of the things that have happened. I'm sure the majority of you know about St. Jude and Muddy Waters and, and the whole thing that happened a couple months ago with that. Um, we want to make sure that if coordinated disclosure is happening, and we do want coordinated disclosure to be happening, that everybody has the, the game plan and that everybody is comfortable and everybody understands um, the, the way to go about it. So Alan has actually attended two of the roundtables that we've had with members of the medical device and auto industries, and I have to say I think they have gone very well. Um, so we are going to continue working on coordinated disclosure. We're trying to figure out if there are things that our committee can do to help you guys in terms of being protected and if you're doing the right thing. We want to make sure that you aren't being punished for it. We also want to make sure that the companies and the possibly the patients and the drivers and everybody else are safe. So it's a, it's a lot of things to balance, but we're working on it and we intend to keep working on it. Um, one of the other big things that I've been involved in in the past couple of months, uh, if any of you, I'm sure you have, have heard of the encryption working group that was a joint effort between Energy and Commerce and Judiciary in the House following what happened in April with the FBI and Apple. Um, I was one of the staffers who worked on that. So that was a, a long, month-long process of um, taking meetings and, and examining the issues and, and trying to figure out what Congress could do. Um, we put our report out at the end of the year. And our first observation was that Congress should not support legislation that creates backdoors in uh, technology solutions. <laughs> uh, so the, the work is not done. The work will certainly continue. Um, but like Alan said, and the, the whole reason we're here, we need your guys' help in terms of making sure we don't make mistakes and making sure that we don't do something that we think is going to be a good move but turns out to be a bad move. Um, so please, uh, my email is up there. Um, please feel free to get in contact with me in terms of the, the encryption issues. Um, a couple of other quick things that I work on. I do a lot with medical device cybersecurity, just working directly with the companies uh, in terms of trying to figure out how to get medical devices up to a more secure level um, besides coordinated disclosure issues and things like that. Same thing with um, automobile cybersecurity is a, is a big one that we're concerned about right now and continue to work on. And then this is more of a wonky government thing, but. Um, we have so many federal agencies that are under our jurisdiction that we are very concerned about the agency's cybersecurity. So we, uh, there's a blog post up for one agency that we did. Uh, we worked with behind the scenes. They had a very bad vulnerability in their website that could have led to a compromise, we think, of their whole system. Um, so we worked with them to get that addressed, and it ended up being a, a very good engagement. So um, those are the things that I do, and I will turn it over to, to Eric. Um, so earlier, I, in my intro, I said um, that we were sort of trying to de-lobotomize the government which, on technology, which is a little intense. And actually, there, one of the things that I've learned of the last two years is that there are an incredible number of good technologists uh, sprinkled all throughout the government in places you would least expect it. Um, but one thing that, is, that seems to be very common in the government is that uh, the technologists and the technology organizations are not very empowered to take risk. Um, and so there is uh, just an immense amount of fear uh, at least through the government, uh, which is, I think, literally why you hear the term cyber instead of information security, um, is that uh, you know, why you hear cloudy language and cloudy thinking, because it is uh, fundamentally a word that is synonymous with fear. Um, so we, GSA broadly, the GSA, GSA as an agency, um, so absorb, they view it as their mission to absorb first mover risk uh, on behalf of the rest of the government with modern technology, uh, you know, first into the cloud for you know, core docs and email and calendar and, and in the government. Uh, GSA has a role in helping agencies procure things that they might not otherwise do. So we try to lower the barrier both mechanically and through precedent. And so 18F, um, the technology organization that I'm a part of there, tries to be a logical extension of that um, by actually helping directly uh, do hosting as a service, uh, custom software development as a service, helping people procure technology, and actually embedding ourselves with their teams over time so that we can build trust and help change how they operate. And we get to learn a lot from them too. Um, other observation is that uh, policy and practice are just incredibly intertwined disciplines in the federal government. So if you are, you know, if you're 
working with technology long enough, you have some really valuable things to say around what policy should be. And if you're doing policy as a professional and you spend too far, you're too far or too long away from the practice, then you at least need to, to be uh, actively pulling in people who are, who are doing that on the ground in order for you to actually do a good job. Um, so we try to help also be, make sure that the government arrives at better decisions when, when we can. Um, so we, we, we involved in a number of things. We are also trying to contribute to uh, good vulnerability disclosure policies and good relationships with the security community. Um, we, uh, we in fact have a, have a vulnerability disclosure policy that we put out a few months ago, one of the first uh, in the government, and uh, you know, worked with the Department of Justice to have good CFAA language, um, try, to, try to do things right and how people would want them to be. Uh, we uh, also recently uh, put out, job, we, we took advantage of some, uh, the government has, has pretty good information security hiring authority. The, the government has, has kind of cleared the way to uh, reduce bureaucracy and make it easier to hire information security professionals. But by and large, most agencies um, will do things like require top, top secret security clearances already. Um, or they'll, they'll want you to be incredibly familiar with federal security requirements, or they'll be ultimately hiring you really to do policy and not implementation. So we, we tried to actually get use that authority to get a uh, high, high amount of responsibility, direct implementation roles that don't require security clearances, and we had an anomalously good ex and easy experience recruiting good people as a result uh, to GSA doing that. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that one, one of the things that we've been particularly involved in um, is really trying to get encryption uh, by default as a matter of course for government agencies and especially government's public internet surface area. And so we've, we've taken the view and, and, and worked with various people uh, in, in the White House and other places to make it the norm and, and the policy and technically enforced that everything that goes between the federal government over the public internet to anybody, be it staff of the public or a foreign national, is just encrypted strongly, strict transport, all of that. And wor working on that has been, um, it's been really helpful to see how, how much, when you, when you get down to it, that there's almost never any daylight between what is good for the internet as a whole and good for the, for the community as a whole and what's actually good for the, for the federal government. So I'll turn that over to, to Nick. So from where I sit, uh, it's much more of a 30,000 foot view in Congress. We're not mostly involved in the in day-to-day -day implementation of policy um, like Alan and uh, Eric, although we strongly support. I mean, one of, one of the roles of Congress is basically as the country's board of directors. It's to provide strategic policy guidance um, that the executive agencies will then implement and that we'll look into an oversight. And one of the, the ways that uh, my boss views his role is to support efforts like Allen's. Um, I was actually on the, one of the vulnerability disclosure working groups or Eric's. Uh, we have strongly supported vulnerability disclosure policies at 18F, at the Department of Defense, Hack the Pentagon. Those are things where we can stand up in Congress and say, this is vitally important to the nation. We care about it. Let's make sure that this keeps going forward. Um, however, I also work in politics. I'm a policy advisor. I'm paid by the government, but it's a very political space, needless to say, the House of Representatives. And one of the things in politics we, uh, we talk about is, what have you done for me lately, right? So here are a couple things that Congress has done. Um, one that's kind of broad and one that's more specific to, to what my boss has worked very closely on in the last year that are directly affecting your lives as security researchers. The first, the broad one, is the Cybersecurity Act of 2015, passed in December of 2015. We're in implementation right now. It's CISA, CISPA, information sharing. It's got a bunch of different names. It passed as part of a larger bill at, at the end of 2015. And what that means for security researchers is that as long as you are sharing indicators of compromise in a way that minimizes any sort of uh, personally identifiable information in them, you are protected uh, from any particular liability that may result in that. And that's a big deal. I mean, it's not, it is not the be-all and end-all of cybersecurity legislation by any mean, means, but it is a big deal. It is one of the most substantive 
pieces of cybersecurity legislation to pass in the last decade. And it will, hopefully, as uh, lawyers get a better grasp on what exactly is allowed in the law and look at the policy guidance that's been put out by the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security, materially affect the way that you're able to share indicators, hopefully in a way that cuts through as much red tape that you have with, again, mostly lawyers, uh, as possible. On a more, uh, something that I have spent a lot of time working on and that my boss has, uh, Congress really was uh, instrumental, I think it's fair to say, in convincing the Obama administration to go back and change its position on the, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to get a little wonky, I'm warning you, the uh, Vassanar arrangement on uh, dual use technologies. So this is basically the major international agreement that governs use of technologies that could be used for national security purposes, but also might have some more benign commercial use as well, things like satellites. Um, in 2013, we added intrusion software command and control devices to that arrangement. And the way the language was drafted, in addition to any concerns you might have about that being export controlled to begin with, the, lay, the way the language was drafted was just poor, plain and simple. And it would have required uh, you to go to the Department of Commerce and get an export license any time you had something like proof of concept code for a novel vulnerability, which is insane. I mean, that's even if you weren't selling something, you just wanted to share it with someone who is not a US citizen. And thanks to efforts from Congress, people like my boss, we got 125 members, more than a quarter of the House, to send a letter to Susan Rice, who's the National Security Advisor, that said, this policy is not tenable. The US needs to change its position, needs to go back and try and renegotiate what the underlying language of that arrangement is. And we're in the process of doing that right now. And that is because of feedback. The only reason that my boss knew that existed is because security researchers came to him and came to me and said, do you realize what we've signed on to? And we said, no, what did, what did we sign on to? You know? And uh, working together with folks that could you know, help me understand exactly what it is we had signed up to is the reason that we were able to build a coalition in Congress, take it to the administration, change the position of the administration, and hopefully we'll make some progress among the other 40 nations in convincing them that uh, there's a serious problem here that, that needs to be corrected. That was great work. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a little over 20 minutes for questions from you guys. This is your chance to uh, ask the feds. Um, just a couple of quick caveats first. Um, as you ask your questions, we're going to be trying to answer them, but be aware that we have bosses. And so uh, we're going to try to be as helpful as possible. Uh, but you, know, you may want to think about how to frame your question to elicit a good answer from us as opposed to a no comment from us. Uh, and the second is, of course, uh, that questions are relatively short and end in an interrogative punctuation mark. Uh, Frank is going to be our, our human mic stand, and I think it's going to be easiest enough if we have a queue in the center here, uh, and then we can uh, take your questions. So please come on up. So he's a mic stand? <laughs> so you talk about the vault. Sorry, this is too big a target. Um, Gary Reimer, you talked about um, trying to have legislation to make it easier and safer for people to do vulnerabilities. And I've thought about actually asking the government, I, this is, I might get booed, but asking the government to take an additional step and actually have a Department of Vulnerability Response re Reporting where if I as a researcher have a vulnerability and I think the company's going to be hostile, I report it to the government, the government reports, they don't know who I am in that way, and it's not going to be for necessarily getting paid for reporting a vuln, but who's the government going to go after? The government says, hey, you've got this vulnerability, how'd you find out? Somebody told us, deal with your vulnerability, and that way the researcher is absolutely insulated. You, you are in luck. It is Ooh, such a good a idea one. that uh, there is an organization that has been fulfilling that role for quite some time called CERT, uh, the, which used to stand for the Computer, Computer Emergency Response Team, but now is just CERT. 
Uh, and CERT will, if you cannot reach an organization and you cannot work with brilliant people in the field and you cannot work with uh, databases that are slowly being built so that every organization in the world has some point of contact, uh, CERT will take that and try to find it for you. Uh, and so that is, uh, and if you, and there's a guy named Art Mannion uh, who has devoted, you know, countless years uh, to, to making this process as effective as possible with the overall goal of security, not just to disclose and talk publicly, but working with the vendor to make sure that we're protecting society. Well, and so I, I'm going to give a slightly different answer too, which is I think, uh, you know, I, I've seen both anecdotally and then publish research showing plenty of evidence that indirect reporting is tough for anybody to get right, even people whose job it is to do it. Like reporting to an intermediary who then has to go and convince another organization to prioritize the resources, like that, that level of indirection um, results in a serious drop off in efficacy. Uh, the, the legal challenges you're identifying are really obvious. Um, I think right now there seems to be a lot of attention both inside the government and outside of the government of trying to fix that underlying legal problem um, and making it, making it f just far more easy across the board and less scary for people to do that reporting. Um, I think there are lots of there are lots of things that the government could do and get involved in to try to be a neutral intermediary. Um, and maybe you know we should be giving more resources to the groups like CERT that do that sort of thing to help them do it better. But ultimately, like there's no nothing beats telling the people who own the system what their problems are as long as they're not going to flip out at you. And it's, it's solving that problem that I, I think is the most important thing. So sure, I can send an email to cert.gov or whatever it right. is and just say this is the vulnerability. You go tell them and walk away from it if I want? Yes. Cool. Thanks. In fact, it's a secure <laughs> form. Hi, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm interested in the healthcare space. Um, my question is, I think a lot of F the FDA's draft guidance really sucks. Um, <laughs> what's the best way to tell them that their guidance sucks? Who are they working with and how can we make them talk to the experts about their regulatory instructions? Excellent. <laughs> so what I would say is um, Dr. Schwartz, the FDA, is the person who's handling a lot of this. She's the, the, the point of contact for most of this and she is very open-minded when it comes to the security research community. I assume the majority of you are either familiar with Joshua Corman or I Am The Cavalry. He works quite a bit with, uh, with FDA and has been helping make sure that their guidance is at least somewhat technically informed. Um, I know on first read, it probably seems like it's terrible and it's not going to accomplish its overall goals. Sometimes uh, government moves slowly and it takes a couple of iterations to get right. So the guidance that just came out will be updated. And as continuous feedback comes in, it will continue to be refined. Um, the thing that gets a little bit tough, and this is one of the things that I would say for you guys looking to work with the government, the regulatory environment in a lot of this is very difficult to navigate. And so when you're looking at industries like healthcare, or like auto, uh, it's, it's not as easy to just do the smart thing. Sometimes what seems like the smart thing is, uh, is tied up in a bunch of red tape and you kind of have to navigate it. So. Um, to answer your original question, I would say the, the best way to do it is probably if you're not a member of I Am The Cavalry, if you're, if you're not in contact with, uh, with them, I would say that's the best way to do it. They have kind of become a touchstone for a lot of uh, federal agencies um, and they can help put you in contact with the right people and, and help you um, navigate sort of the, the Byzantine bureaucracy. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add two things to that. Um, the first is that uh, the vast majority of rules that come out of the federal government are open for public comment at some point. Now, understanding when the rule comes out tends to be the hardest point part to commenting because commenting is really, they often have email addresses. Um, literally, you can send something to it. You can upload something, a PDF of your comments, um, and they will be considered. It is, Congress has mandated <laughs> that Federal agencies must consider the comments that they receive, and in working with agencies, they really do. I mean, there are a lot of things that are commented that they are well aware of, and they will try and explain in their response to the comments why they had already considered this. But there are definitely things that they aren't aware of. And um, the other part about commenting is that uh, that's another great place to engage your congressman. So 
how did I get engaged in Bosnar in the first place? Well, the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is an agency of the Department of Commerce, put out a rule for comment. And while it was out for comment, a number of people in the security research community said, hey, we're going to comment. This thing looks awful. And they also reached out to members of Congress. And the members of Congress said, OK, explain to me what this does and why it's so problematic. But my boss submitted comments as well. Um, and that, I can promise you, got people at the agency to look up and say, whoa, what, what are members of Congress talking about this for? And that's really what set us on the path to eventually convincing the administration. So if there is a rule that you have a problem with, talk to staffers in your congressman's office. Talk to staffers like me. <laughs> and uh, we will try and do our best to address your problems and either help explain why we think that the policy is working or try and get it changed. Uh, I want to add a, just a tiny thing on that, which is if, go to the Federal Register. Uh, and, and actually, if, especially if there's a rule that you've heard about or that you care about the issue, like federalregister.gov is a recent modern application with a JSON API and uh, like is open source and runs in the cloud and is the official place where all comments get put out for proposals. They now have integrated with other regulatory systems. You can submit a comment right there. And all agencies are legally required to respond to all substantive comments. And they really matter. And typically, too often, only like industry people who are paid to comment will do it. So you should show up. And that is where stuff happens. And it's actually a decent user experience. Hello. Um, I was just wondering about, uh, do you guys know about the Family Act of 2005? No? Oh, well, that's basically, it's all about, <clears throat> like, giving uh, users, home users, the freedom to, like, uh, freedom to, like, if they want to, like, filter their movies inside their house, they can choose to do so. But it seems like um, there's a huge uh, legal battle with the last uh, um, movie filtering um, company called VidAngel. And um, I was just wondering about like um, Hollywood's Hollywood's basically suing them, and I was just wondering if you guys could look into that um, because they're like um, if they lose the battle, um, basically the Family Movie Act will be ineffective for a, a long time, and uh, I was just like um, asking you to look into that and also being able to. Uh, see about like um about encouraging people in the government to like change the family movie act in order for hollywood to not misconstrue the rules in the in the in the courtroom so thank you no this is helpful and this is part of the engagement that we're trying to do is is work harder to learn what is going on in the community uh one thing that we will say uh we should mention earlier is uh, we are going to be available not immediately after this talk, because after this is Ask the EFF, uh, and we are curious what the EFF is interested in, and also what you guys want to know from the EFF. But after that, we will be in the lounge upstairs, and if you want to talk with us about Family Act or the FDA or whatever you like, we are very happy to hear from you. Uh, we can get to that more detail. Yeah. And our emails are up on the, uh, yes. the board for a reason, too. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. I was just curious what the distribution of Congress people is who have, like, a technologist that can actually be on their staff to let them know, hey, this is something we care about. Because I'm thinking it's not just going to be people who are on the committees for air quotes, the C word, ver. Um, so it's going to span all of the different spheres. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to let the staffers talk. But first, I just want to know from my perspective inside the government how amazing it is to have staffers on the Hill <laughs> who understand the technology that we inside the government can communicate to and have a frank and open discussion. That is unfortunately all too rare. Every single uh, one counts. <laughs> there is a fellowship uh, called Tech, Tech, Tech Congress. Tech Congress. Um, and why doesn't someone else talk about <laughs> how great it is and how you can apply to spend a year on the Hill helping out in your own right? You sure. So uh, first, to, to answer the question, um, most personal staff for a member of Congress will have anywhere from two to six policy staff. And they have to chop the federal government up into 
that many pieces and advise Congress votes, we vote on everything. Anything the federal government does, <laughs> Congress is gonna vote on it at some point and we have to be the subject matter experts. So expecting that there are gonna be a lot of people that are you know, fully versed in technical details uh, that are working for personal staff of members of Congress, it's not a realistic expectation. On the other hand, there are a lot of people, one of the first things, you know, you don't last long on the Hill if you don't like to learn things because uh, it is a very fast paced environment and you are literally learning things every hour of every day about uh, how the government works, how your constituents feel about different, different programs. And there are a lot of people that want to learn more on the Hill about tech policy and don't necessarily know whom to turn to. And as a, as a matter of fact, when people are soliciting you to come and talk to you about something, um, it is much easier to listen to them than to listen to, to actively go out, particularly when you're working, you know, 60 hour weeks anyways. So uh, I think that there, we wish, I, I mean, Jessica can talk about this ad nauseum and it's wonderful, uh, about there need to be more people that have computer science degrees so that, that, that go and work on the Hill, so that when I'm in my graduating class and they're saying where everyone's going, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, grad school, and they say, oh, he's going to Capitol Hill, everyone doesn't turn and be like, what? <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, one of the most productive ways to get staff to know more is to proactively reach out to them and not just rely on, you know, in their 60 hour work weeks, they're deciding, oh yeah, I'm gonna pull someone, a security researcher's name from a hat and go in and ask the question. Um, pushing is, is very effective in terms of helping to educate the staff and they do want to learn. That is w w one of the primary job requirements for being on the Hill. Yeah, so what Nick is referring to, <laughs> stand microphone. What Nick is referring to is he and I have sat in uh, the Longworth Cafeteria Slipper Times and I've lost it and gone on very long rants about how there's no technical expertise in Congress. It is incredibly rare. Um, I don't really know how to fix that. I've tried to talk to my own university, other universities, um, about how we can get more, more tech people in. Unfortunately, the reality of the Hill is you don't make a lot. Um, you're very busy and if you're in a, I'm an, on a committee staff which is different than personal staff so I have a little bit more freedom in what I can work on. I only work on cybersecurity issues um, but a lot of the times your focus gets very divided between several issues so I think I would pile on to what Nick said. Uh, if you want there to be more tech expertise in Congress, come work for Congress. Uh, we'd love to have you. So my, my name is Trey Forgety. I'm with the 911 Association. Um, in the spirit of reaching out to uh, actively uh, in, engage with uh, with feds on these issues, um, in addition to being director of government affairs, I handle all the information security for our organization, uh, especially infosec policy. So I want to put it on your radar screen. We have uh, 7,000 911 centers in this country. Um, those include military or uh, military and government facilities that GSA has some responsibility for. Um, all of those are aging rapidly. We have telecommunications networks that are switching from TDM to IP very, very quickly. We have 700 selective routers in this country that route 911 calls to the right 911 center that just recently went completely out of manufacturer support. Even if they're flooded tomorrow, we can't fix them. We have to transition to NG911 today to get everything off onto uh, IP-based networks. And in doing that, we have to make sure that state and local governments are empowered to secure those systems. That's something only Congress can help with right now. It's a, it's a problem of, it's on the scale of FirstNet. Um, and it's, so it's something that we've got to do and we've got to do quickly. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there to say, please help us out. I mean, the, 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 the 911 calls are uh, a, an important critical public safety infrastructure. Uh, they matter for national security. Um, so uh, I'm happy to en engage on that issue anytime, but it's, it's one that uh, I'm passionate about, our organization is passionate about. We've got to fix it fast. What, what I would say is um, my committee has jurisdiction over that issue with the Communications and Technology Subcommittee. So if you want to send me an email and you want to have a, sit down and have a conversation about it, absolutely. That's how easy it is to engage <laughs> with Congress, is send me an email and we, if you could work hard to find the right staffer, or the right person in the administration, 15 minute phone call, quick chat, that's how it works. Yeah, I had um, a question if you have any insights or suggestions on how to engage the incoming administration 
with this community and these issues and to help the transition in general? Who wants the first take on that one? <laughs> All right, I guess it's me. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, during any transition, you know, it's, it's tough to say exactly what, tra transitions are chaotic times for any administration when they're shifting. There are a ton of 3,000 plus appointee ships that have to be filled. Um, and those are going to need to get filled before you can start kind of uh, setting up policy from, from the top down. But uh, as a matter of, you know, for, for, first of all, at the very basic level, Congress has mandated a lot in terms of what executive agencies have to do uh, in terms of reaching out to public and being transparent, requiring comments. Um, none of this is going to change when an administration changes. Uh, so I think that, you know, since the newest administration doesn't even take office for another week, it's kind of premature to say what the best avenue for engagement will be based on, you know, the, the fingerprints of that administration vice the current Obama administration. Uh, but there will definitely still, at, at the very least, there will be extensive opportunities that are mandated in federal law for the public to engage with specific rules and regulations. And uh, in my experience, there, there will, okay, so that's one. Two, there will be people that are career public servants, uh, like some of my fellow panelists, who the administration changes, but they're still there and they're still gonna be working to the greatest extent, you know, that they're allowed to, to reach out to the community. Um, and three, uh, most, in, I mean, if you go back and look at the way most administrations have been run, they are interested in feedback from stakeholders. And one of the ways to ensure that you're a stakeholder in the community is to reach out and say, I'm here, I'm in your district if it's a member of Congress, which most members of Congress, I think, think that, you know, the InfoSec community is in California, maybe in Boston or Austin, and that's about it. So if you're from there, then maybe you've got, you know, constituents that, that care about this stuff and you'll be more inclined to do that. They have no idea that it's spread across every congressional district has InfoSec professionals. And if you don't reach out and tell your member of Congress that, they're not going to know. There are, only other thing I would add is a number of organizations, uh, Mozilla, CDT, uh, the Open Technology Institute, have written documents of here's what we think the next administration should focus on. Uh, so look around for those, and if there are things that you like, try to amplify them. Uh, make sure that people in your community read them and keep them alive so that as the administration becomes online, uh, those issues don't go away. Um, I want to add, too, that it, every, it doesn't matter what administration it is, all new political appointees want quick wins. So yes. uh, thinking in that mentality, at least at the start of an administration, is probably always helpful. Like what things, you know, just we're waiting for somebody to finally make it a priority for a little bit to just get it done. Um, so that's something to think about. The other thing is the thing that a lot of people in the technical community generally, not just the InfoSec community, have a tough time finding the time and energy ability to do, which is long form writing. Like actually become, like write more, like write blog posts. Um, if, you, if you're courageous, like maybe try to write some op-eds and try to get them placed in different things. Um, just be, be writing and, and also just be developing your writing skills because I promise you that, you know, if you, whether you're filing a comment on a regulation or you're just sending an email to somebody with a DACA of email address or .mil, uh, that the quality of your writing is maybe the single most important factor as to how seriously that gets taken. So get, become good writers. Keep writing. So we just have a few minutes, and I want to make sure that, that we guys can sort of have the, the last message on how to engage. And so we're going to do a lightning round. Uh, all three ask very quick questions, and we will see if we can give very brief answers. And this will also just make sure that we're aware of what you have to say. So quick, thank you. Sure. So I've heard a lot about reaching out to your representative in Congress. For those of us who live in the District of Columbia, <laughs> what is a productive way that we can express our opinion on upcoming legislation? DC gets both a delegate and a shadow representative. It's like you have two representatives. 
Uh, so earlier this year, we had uh, uh, MedSec investigate or release the reports on St. Jude's medical devices. What do you think about this as a way for security researchers to invoke market forces to get people to make better products? So, so you mean pub public disclosure? Yes. Um, I think we fully support coordinated disclosure. I think good points have been raised about when coordinated disclosure doesn't work and we're trying to explore what happens then. I think generally speaking, we are concerned about the patient safety impacts that that could have had and we would have probably preferred that that didn't go down the way that it did. Um, the White House Commission on Cybersecurity report had a lot of mention around skills gap alternative training paths. Um, one of the recommendations was spinning up the, the federal government either spin up or help support uh, an apprenticeship program of some sort, which sounds great, but given that the federal government is so vast and there's a transition coming, um, who could possibly own that or help support that? Maybe there's a, a seed of a, a pilot in the GSA, for instance. Uh, right. so, go ahead. So, um, well, let me, let me answer the first question about DC, um, which is that we do have a delegate. I am a DC resident as well. Um, she is on committees. She signs letters. She does not get a vote in the House um, constitutionally. But beyond that, uh, she's very engaged and, uh, you know, on a day-to-day on a -day basis, her staff are involved in policy making. So, you know, again, speaking personally, I would love to see DC get a representative, but uh, I think that you, it's, it's very easy to undercount the amount of impact that our delegate can have uh, in the House in policy making. So definitely reach out to her staff. There's also, you know, if you live in DC, you do have a bit of a ground game advantage. You can show up to things uh, much more easily, be they after work or before work or like whatever. Just showing up physically, I'll tell you like, there have been so many events where I've been the only person with an engineering background who's showing up and trying to speak, you know, in an in a intelligent way about something to a, a non-technology audience. And, uh, I, you know, that there are many events at which there are none, and there, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, on the apprenticeship side program, like a lot of things in the Commission's report, it was a great idea, but actually spinning it up is going to require a lot of intense policy work at a fairly low level. One thing I will flag, especially for the uh, Schmooze for ShmooCon uh, students in the room, if you're not aware of something called Scholarship for Service, um, the federal government will pay for you to get a degree or a master's degree in anything related to information security. They'll give you a stipend. Uh, they'll send you to college. They'll get you a degree. Uh, and all you do is for every year that the government gives you, you give them a year back. That means you get on-the-job training. Uh, and a couple of years working for the government is really useful uh, down the road. And I have a So just, just to repeat that for everyone, um, all federal agencies do have internship programs. You can reach out to the agencies directly. One other thing on, on apprenticeships in general is one of the things that policymakers look at, particularly at Congress, is are there successful models that we can look at, um, especially for running a national program? So that might involve Congress authoriz authorizing a pilot program, but if there is, if you think apprenticeship would be helpful, and you have a reason to think that because you've seen a cybersecurity, information security apprenticeship program work, then putting that in front of policymakers and saying, look, this had measurable effects. This is, it brought all these extra people in. It's helping to close the talent gap. Let's try and broaden this is an extremely effective form of advocacy. So Nick, since the mic's in front of you, 30 seconds, what would you like to see people in this room do to get engaged? The number one thing that I think that people can do is tell their congressmen that they exist and that information security is not a niche issue that a couple of computer scientists in the House um, are interested in and a couple of national security wonks like my boss got interested in, but it's something that 
is pervasive, it's in every district, it affects every community, and that they need to pay more attention to vice leaving it to the people in Congress that otherwise have um, some interest in, in the topic. I think that is the number one most important thing. If everyone in this room went home, wrote their congressman and said, I'm an information security professional in your district and I'm paying attention to this, it would help enormously. Eric, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, I think I've already beat the drum about participating and showing up and commenting. I do want to say uh, an additional thing, which is that you know, if the government, if an agency, if Congress, if, if some random office does something bad, uh, then don't worry. Like people are going to criticize it, and it's going to—you know—people are going to get super mad. That there's a whole bunch of people who will take care of that. Uh, if the government does something good, very often, very little. Uh, it's it, it's often enough that doesn't get noticed at all. And I, but when people do notice that, when an office or an agency actually does, like people reward them for doing a good thing and sticking their neck out a little bit. Uh, it, it, that gets noticed, and the people who did that inside the office of the agency uh, become more respected, more credible, and you start getting more things like that. So really taking the time to, when you see that, just, just say something nice. Uh, you know, if you're in a position to write something about it, that always helps, but just that, that sort of dynamic is good, too. Jessica. All right, so what I would say, um, I have over the years developed quite a relationship with at least certain members of the security research community, and I think the biggest thing that has been helpful for me is um, when people are optimistic about what the government can do. Usually people get very cynical. The government's never going to be able to do anything right, which doesn't help when we are trying to do things right. So be optimistic. I would also say be patient. We're all learning. There's not a lot of technologists in the government, but we are trying, and as you can see, we're, we're getting a growing group of people in the government who understand technology and who are trying to do good things. So be patient with us, we're doing our best. And then the last thing I would say is have empathy. Our jobs are really hard. We get yelled at a lot. And then if we do something wrong, usually not only do we get yelled at in private, but we get torn a new one by the press. So try and understand a little bit where we're coming from as we're trying to, to step into things that we may not understand with bosses who have five million other things going on, with constituent concerns that may not align with yours, and just Work with us. We're, we're, we're trying our best. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the final thing I will add is that there you know, are ways to get involved. Uh, we've talked about uh, the cavalry. Uh, it has had a huge impact in the Department of Commerce, the Department of Defense, and the FDA across the government. Uh, there are smart, dedicated people in the room who have been there. Uh, and if you don't if you haven't reached out, now is the time to start. Um, but even just Twitter is useful. Uh, people in the community, usually someone you know will know someone who's connected to the policy community. And as you use Twitter, just remember, we all get tweeted at a lot. Uh, the ones who do and it And our Twitter accounts are not official accounts. They're not. They're not. <laughs> uh, but the ones who do it constructively uh, and actually say, rather than just you know, repeating the comment section, uh, are the ones that we're going to engage and respond to and sort of reach out and say, hey, let's schedule a call. Tell me how we can do our job better. Uh, so please, don't hesitate to engage. We'll be upstairs in the lounge after the Ask the EFF, uh, and they'll tell you how we're doing our job uh, wrong and how we can do it better. So take that into account. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Isn't it strange? Let me be the one you rearrange Let's start a chain reaction